that gets the back of people's heads. I'll sit yeah, next to her. She'll just give me jabs at the side. I'm not saying that I can change it very easily, but I like it. Imagine so why you'll have to uh, see more than just once once before, before we start, really. Uh, one, uh, one important thing about the chant, precisely. Mm. Now, because I've seen this in, in Mary's house, I don't know how, uh, but it is not like it is written in Mary's house. I, mean, I don't know where he got that from. He says the, garage. No, no, no. Well, that's what the chant, Yeah, 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 the chant, yeah, but the writing, because you know the original oh, you mean is, in yeah. is, you know, with Sanskrit, with Sanskrit okay. letters, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh -huh. yeah. the pronunciation is important. So it is, I'm going to put it like in Spanish, where an E, E is like bet, the E in, a, in bet, you know, mm -hmm. and A is A, and E is the I of I, right. so like in Spanish. It's aim, <coughs> cream with an H, yeah, yeah. cream, 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 cha, when I read, when I put this together, means that you, you say, it's chamundaye. You have to do the ye, ye, ye. Yippee, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it could be ye, ye, ye. But that's the, the last one is important because if you would transliterate the letters in Sanskrit, it would be written like this. Chech. Chech, okay. Yeah. So it's a very short second chech. Aimim krim chamundaye vi chech. It's not church because it is pronounced church. 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 Not like church. church. But it's a so short E, not a long E. So it's a brim grim chamdai vi church. A brim grim chamdai vi church. And remember, it's always with. It's a pranayama mantra. Breathing. A brim grim chamdai vi church. You left out the V though. Aim him, cream, chamundaye, vi, che, che. What? Yeah. Aim him, cream, chamundaye, vi, che, che. You left out the V though. Where's the V? Yeah. Like the V. Ah, sorry. Aim him, cream, chamundaye, vi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Forgot that one. Aim him, cream, chamundaye, vi, che, che. So it's not che. you know, I write it like this because but this is like a very short E, you know, short. Yeah, short. Because in original, in original writing is like this, which is church. church. Right, but it's church. But you know, when you say it, it's a church, church kind of thing, church. Yeah, yeah. Church. Like Chechenia. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna start um, now with with a satsang mm -hmm. that we will be. <coughs> I will put you. It's a guru Raj satsang. It's a Guru Raj Satsang. Uh, it is after a question of Rupa to Guru Raj asking if life is. Why do we perceive life as problematic? Mm -hmm. The Satsang is very good because it 
gives you probably all the essential things of our method, of the method that we teach. And it is also the situation by which your students will come to you. Because 99.999% of your students will come because they feel their life is problematic. Yeah. And they want to get out of the problematic perception of their own life. So I will start with that. I will stop the satsangs, the satsang maybe to add some ideas here and there. And by half past 12, uh, which is in 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, we will be joined by Jeff Carr by Zoom, and he will be, you know, uh, uh, giving us a little talk about uh, something that I told him to speak about. <laughs> and then when we, when we finish with Jeff, that will be around one o'clock, we will go for the paella. And while we put the fire and prepare all this, so that's part of the kind of the mechanism. <laughs> we used to do it in Guruji's courses, in Spain at least, we cooked you know, we had the, the cooking was part of the course. Cooking and then putting the table together and having lunch together. It's part of, you know, businesses, you close businesses, having dinner together, you, you know, it's a part of what we do and what we teach. To cook together and, you know, eat together. You know that in Zen monasteries, the two top figures are the abbot, that's the, the head, but the second is the kitchen <laughs> the cook, the cook, the cook the chef. Is, is the second in the monastery, in the same monasteries, is kind of the vice president. <laughs> so cooking, <laughs> cooking and sharing the food together is part of the techniques. If, you want to call it, nice. call it, you know? I like it. So, <laughs> especially if you want to cook. <laughs> so we will start. Ah, I need to put. Ah, okay. <clears throat> to heat up. <coughs> Everything needs to be heated up a little bit <laughs> till it gets clear. <laughs> what is the difference between a human life and a godly life? What can be done with a human life to make it less problematic? To make it less what? To make it less problematic. Problematic. Ah. So you think human life is problematic? Is it? Why is it problematic? The reason why you find human life to be problematic is because you create a distinction in your mind that human life is apart from divine life. That's the first idea. You know, satsangs of Guruach have so many, he used to say revolutionary ideas, but they are in fact revolutionary. If you compare the traditional spiritual teachings with, let's call it, the version of those very same teachings that Guruji gave. Mm, and this is very standard. So, the first idea here is, we consider that human life 
the life we have, is separate yeah. from divine life. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, divine life is meant, look, you know, like life in a whole. Divine as the manifestation of divinity. And the manifestation, you know, what, what we could call the personal God. The sum totality of this manifestation. The sum totality of everything that is going on, moment by moment, would be divine life. And we think that our human life, as we perceive it, as we perceive ourselves, separate from divine life, and as we feel separate, and we feel that the other is kind of even threatening, you know, we have, we all somehow have or have had at least in the past the sensation that in any moment, you know, I can be run over by circumstances, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, the universe is not conscious of me, so I have to be aware <laughs> <laughs> to, to defend myself <laughs> of any possible, and that's not how it works. It's just a misunderstanding of the mind that makes you believe what it's not real and when you believe what it's not real you go through suffering and for example there is a good example in for example my daughter my daughter believes things that are not real that make her suffer as if it was in right. as if she was in hell but they are not real but if you believe it to be real, then it looks like it is real for you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it looks like it is not real. So the first point in this satsang is, you know, the main thing is that you think you are separate from that divine life that you are aspiring to, but in fact you are not. The day when man realizes that human life is none other than God life, there would be no problems at all. It's only a sentence, but yes, yes. the day you realize right. that human life is God life, problems will stop. In other words, the best, man, the best expression of God in this planet Earth where we live, there are other planets that are much better than this one, I tell you, by experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they had to get me drunk to come here. <laughs> work, uh, but, you know, yeah. human beings are the, the best expression of divinity in this planet. Because it is the expression of consciousness, the expression of the divine, the expression of, you know, in the evolutionary level where this planet is at, but this is the planet where we are in and the planet we know. And, you know, any human being is your personal God because it is an expression of God. And we lack, in fact, as an expression of God. Problems only come about because your mind tells you all the time because of previous patternings that my life is human and insignificant and of no value. While that which has value is the divine life. Now that is the greatest fallacy perpetrated upon man by all kinds of theologies throughout the ages and throughout the world. We, you know, inherit the patterns, the understanding, the language of our parents. And you know, if our parents, if our family in year 1000 told us that the <coughs> earth was flat, we would regard that as to be true, and so on and so forth. And for centuries, we've been trained into belief that you, you're, you are a sinner, for centuries, eh? you are a sinner, uh, insignificant, 
subject to <coughs> go to hell <laughs> and burn there for, you know, under torture for eternity. And we, the church or whatever the case could be, can provide you the keys to get out of that insignificant reality in where you live. And for generations people have believed that and have transmitted that to their children. Mm -hmm. And we have it implanted. Mm -hmm. We have implanted that belief. Mm -hmm. And and that's the major fallacy perpetrated of humanity by theologies and religions all around the world. Because they've done it in the West as well as in the East. It's, yeah, it's right. not that they are different to us. They are human beings also. If theology had not become a business and had to start with the central principle that man you are divine and would have trained you over these thousands of years that have passed that man you are divine your problems would have not been there. So what are you? You are nothing but a puppet. You know a puppet? Yes. Yeah. And the strings are pulled by the people in power. Because it's, you know, one of the few instances in which Guru Raj is political. There are other, in, other instances, for example, I would have to name necessarily in these times that we live one instant in which, he sa in which he says, I am not a nationalist, because they ask him something about Hindu nationalism, I am an internationalist. <laughs> so, uh, what happens here is that you know that we are very, very gullible and susceptible of manipulation mm -hmm. with all the things we believe. Mm -hmm. In fact, today, where they can profile you, you know, because there's this big data technology and artificial intelligence and you name it, mm -hmm. and yeah, lots of information about all of you is there in the networks, and they profile you and they say, oh, look, he's a Catholic and this and that. So let, let's tell him that the Pope votes for Trump. Mm -hmm. And then you believe that and then you, you are just a puppet. And who handles the thing? The people in power. <laughs> so what is the secret not to be a puppet? Don't believe anything you think, let alone anything they tell you. Don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Thoughts are thoughts, not the reality. Right. We tend to consider thoughts as the reality. Thoughts are thoughts, and reality or actuality is actuality. And they, not, they are not necessarily the same thing. We today believe, you know, that our reality, that we are in this universe, and you know all these galaxies and all these things. And 1,000 years ago, the universe, and we lived in a flat earth, and there was a celestial thing, and, and this uh, God looking at you with all these people. Wait 1,000 years and see what they will think of, of what we think today that is real. Yeah. Yeah. The same that we think about what they thought <laughs> that it is real. So thoughts are thoughts, not reality. And when you start regarding thoughts as thoughts and not reality, you kind of become non-attached to thoughts. Mm -hmm. And when you become non-attached to your own thoughts, then you are less susceptible to be manipulated. And if they don't pull strings, they would not have the business that they are conducting. I was saying in some satsang not so long ago, somewhere in America I think, that the two greatest businesses and the richest companies in the world 
is the church and the insurance company. The church promises you heaven and salvation after you are dead and the insurance company promises you a lump sum of money after you are dead. But don't you see that life with all its beauty itself is divine? Since you woke up this morning, hmm, how many hundreds of things have you seen around you? And tell me very honestly that out of the hundreds of things you have seen around you from the time you woke up this morning till now, has your mind ever been led by itself to that which is divine? Which means that you, not, you can appreciate one of the words that is used in Sanskrit to describe divinity is sundaram, beauty. Shivam, satyam, shivam is God, satyam is truth, sundaram is beauty. So, and this is part of the good morning process. Since you woke up this morning, how, how, to how many things <coughs> your mind has been led by itself to appreciate that beauty, that divinity. You tell me. Now, because we are thinking that our life is the bullshit we think. <laughs> and it's not that. It's completely... And, and we think that we are separate from it, from it all. And it's not that. that that's, that's the origin of the perception of a problematic life. No. You have you have only viewed life according to your own personal perception. And being so channeled and so limited, your perception and conception of everything around you had only what you regard to be of human value. So you know we have this idea of ourselves which limits our perception and we look things to what we think has value for our conception of what we are. So we miss the whole story. The human life. Yet, just a slight little depth, a slight little depth in the mind that you function with, you will see that human life is not apart from divine life. That you are divine. Everything you perceive is divine and the very organs of perception is divine itself for the object of perception and the subject of perception and the act of perceiving, they're all but the same. Without this is very subtle, but it really means that, you know, it's the same idea that I explained to you that your circumstances are like a mirror of your patterns. If you remember that, what happens is that this is just one thing happening. There's not a subject and an object. It's just one thing happening. You need the object, you need the subject, you need the act of perception. And the three things are just one thing happening at the same time. The subject, the object cannot exist without the act of perceiving the subject and the object has no existence. I will repeat this so that you get it with his own words. Without the subject, the object cannot exist. Without the act of perceiving the subject and the object has no existence. <coughs> Sir. 
life itself is divine. Life is divine and when we talk of free will and divine will, we create distinctions again and again and again. There is only one will. And that will combines what you would regard as free will and what you would regard as divine will. For what is your free will actually? Hmm? You think you are free? Is really free? You are not free. You're in total bondage. There's not a single part of your body or your thought that you can really control and you say, I got free will. Your heart beats away, the blood circulates in your system, all the billions of cells are operating to keep this body together and functionable. How much of it are you controlling? And what right do you have then to say, I have free will? Hmm? Within a certain context, you can say, I have free will, I'll, uh, I'll walk down the three flights of stairs, or I shall take the elevator. That's as far as it goes. In to a total mundaneness. Hmm? But now you tell me what made you decide to take the stairway hmm? or the elevator. What element has been functioning there that made you decide the stairway or the elevator? Is it a power which is beyond yourself or is it a power that is within yourself? So, <clears throat> uh, there is only one will which means that, you know, everything moves according to the laws of God or the laws of nature. You, it's the same thing, it's just two names to speak about one thing. Uh, what is your free will? Maybe in those mundane things you can, you know, take the stairs or the elevator. Uh, maybe if you take the elevator, the elevator crashes because it had a problem and if you take the stairs, no. So, what is it, what power is there that makes you do one thing or the other because it's not your will. I will leave it here because it's time to connect with <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> and we will power. continue. No, <laughs> I will leave you with a question and we will continue afterwards <laughs> with the answer. I'm going now to get uh, Jeff here. Five. Well, we know it was no. a strange no. group. You're left you. You're left you. Yeah. But you didn't realize it was special. It was a special way. Yeah. 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 These four of us. <laughs> well, and you that, both, that. you're both Come left here. Is yeah. your daughter left here? No, but she thought she was until about three, because you know how they mimic? Yeah. yeah. So oh, she was eating and drawing with her left hand, 
until she yeah, realized right. she wasn't lefty. Yeah. Five right here. That's a lot of lefties. No, it's that's really that's a lot of lefties in the room. When a lot of April own... birthdays and a lot of lefties. Yeah. 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 Oh, we have a lot of lefties. All right. So, so is that free left. will or is it the other <laughs> power? <laughs> well, my question yeah. is, and maybe you can answer so I don't have it, why are we so susceptible to listen to our pattern? Because that's all we knew. We were brought up that way. We were born into that. We don't know the difference. It's just evolution that we. We don't realize we're brought up in patterns. We just think that's life. We just accept it as is. We don't know. And that's right, because it's evolutionary. We just continue. He said, John said it's like a fish. Does a fish know? Right. Did they live on the water? Yeah. Well, they know if they, they don't. don't. No. Right. Because yeah. yeah. they know, it, they know right. no other way. I guess right. maybe that's the yeah. thing. Yeah. They know yeah. we don't know right. other way. Yeah. We yeah. do the same thing our parents did. We do the right. same thing. Right. Same 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 these women that go back because it's only now. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hello, Jess. Good. Good. I recognize, I recognize a lot of them. I'm trying to fix this. Are we ready? Good. What I'm going to do is, forgive me, I'm going to mute you guys. First of all, I'm going to, can you record it? Or let me see if I can record it. Okay. You record it. Okay. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do is, forgive me, but I'm going to mute everybody. Otherwise, we hear scratches and burps and noises and all that. So let me go see if I can. Uh... Okay. Can you guys still hear me? All right, good. Uh I heard from Beth. I talked with Beth. When you, I know she's not there today, but I know she's in your class. And I talked with Ramon in the last couple of days. And uh, you guys are getting, uh, in addition to, I think, wonderful teachings. You guys are so fortunate to have Ramon, who knows his stuff. And his mind and the Guru's mind have melded. That's a very Tibetan Vajrayana concept, Buddhist concept, but they're melded. He has a mind melt with the guru, so you guys are getting great stuff. And I know you guys are reviewing a lot of other spiritual paths, and I think that's incredibly wise. Uh, when we, when Ramon and I were sitting with the guru way back when, it was a long time ago in this country's cultural history, in the 80s, and this stuff was being talked about, but it was still relatively new. And a lot of these teachers coming from the East were introducing concepts which are not very well understood. <laughs> well, nowadays we live in a huge spiritual supermarket. There's enormous amounts of this stuff. When I spoke with Beth, she said a little in bewilderment, she said in her, her little, I, I can see better without the glasses actually, but she said in her corner of Vermont, there's at least six different Buddhist congregations. And then there's all these other kinds of yogic traditions. So Ramon asked me to sort of do what's a quick intro to Buddhism for everybody so they know what they're talking about. I've had uh, a lot of Buddhism. I've spent about 12 years with three wonderful Buddhist teachers. So uh, I still love my guru, still part of family, but just I have strayed. And Guru Raj encouraged us to do that. Remember, he said he was bringing the essence the inner meaning of all spiritual traditions. And he liked to tell us that he wasn't here to empty the churches. He wanted to fill them. He wanted, you know, he encouraged us to look into other forms of spirituality. So how to do an overview of Buddhism. And it occurred to me a good way would, I'm going to present four hypothetical students in your classes. And I want to give they're going to represent four principal paths of Buddhism, which I'm going to very, try very hard to introduce to you in only about 20 minutes. Student number one says, 
you know, I'm I'm really stressed out. My life is difficult. By the way, these might represent your own attitudes, too. So see if you recognize yourself in one of these students. The student says, I feel very stressed out and I've been trying to calm down and I don't want to, you know, I have bouts of depression and then a lot of pressure at work and my family and stuff. And I was introduced to meditation through sort of a stress management thing at my local yoga center where we talked about meditation and we, we just how to calm down and follow your breath and stuff. And that really intrigued me. I'm not very good at it, but I'm interested and I want to learn more. Student number one. Then you have another student shows up and they raise their hands because you asked them, what, what, what have you done before? What are you interested in? And the second student says, I just love the Dalai Lama so much. And uh, I've been going to meditation classes and, and uh, we love the Dalai Lama. And I've been reading, uh, you know, Pema Chodron and Thich Nhat Hanh. And I, I really like green Tara. She's my, my goddess, and I, I just identify with her, and I love her so much. So you're listening, okay, where's that person coming from? Okay, that's student number two. Student number three, I took a class, you know, in yoga class, and we did a kundalini workshop, and that was really kind of weird, but I really did feel a lot of energy, and uh, I would, like, what was that about? And we had a uh, the teacher mentioned a guru that he belonged to, and I want to learn more about, uh, you know, uh, energies in my body and uh, uh, about what a guru is and all that. That's student number three. By the way, these are all very viable spiritual paths. They're represented in Buddhism, and there's lots of us. Very, very few people have never heard of meditation. It's almost universal in our culture now that people have done it. And I think also people are yearning for it. They're looking for it. They want to have some way into this. So you guys, that's a third way people frequently might, might express an interest. Here's the fourth one, my favorite. You ask, they say, what are you interested in? The student raises their hand, he says, well, I went to like a, a, one of these meditation talks, sort of like what you're giving. And then the students start, the teachers start talking about this thing called Dzogchen. And it was just like, just, it was sort of like the classes I had in Zen. We just meditate, you know, and it was so cool. I loved the way he talked. What is Dzogchen? What's this about? And, and do you teach Dzogchen? And you're sitting there like, what the heck is Dzogchen? So where are these, these are four different types of students. What, what's the baggage? Where are they coming from? Well, they often espouse one of, as I said, four principal paths in Buddhism. So I went over an elaborate course that I prepared, which I'll send to Ramon if he wants to put them up. The course was an introduction to the four principal paths of Buddhism. And I thought, well, I'll just give them that. Well, I looked at a summary of it. It came to 32 pages, so I'm going to have to. Buddhism is very complicated. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tradition a little like the Christian, our Western Christian tradition. But it started out pretty simple. I mean, there was a guru and a couple of, you know, a bunch of guys and a couple of women. They were a, a merry band, right, way back in Palestine, so we're told. And then look what it's turned into. You know, Christianity is incredibly complicated. Same way with Buddhism. Original Buddhism as taught by the Buddha, as they can reconstruct it a little bit. It's very ancient. And first thing we realize, it's part of Mother India, who gave us, I think, one of the, they, that in the Middle East gave us the greatest planetary treasure trove of spiritual teachings. And Buddhism rose right along with Hinduism and a lot of the other major religious expressions in India. It's 2,600 years old. Back in those days, they were already practicing meditation. And in fact, in Buddha's day, they had many different schools. The basic attitudes or schools of meditation and approach to the divine was already present. Buddha, in a way, was a little bit of a reformer. There was already a priestly class that collected fees and were practicing sort of ritual magic to appease the deities. And Buddha sort of told everybody, you know, you don't need that. You know, you can find happiness inwardly. It's all about managing your mind. Everything comes out of the mind. So far, a little reminiscent of Guru Raj. And he founded a monastic order. 
And early Buddhism was all about don't, you know, you have to leave your job. You need to leave your family. This is a renunciate, a monastic path. It became, so it was really for the very few who were willing to give up the world. Now, I'm going to tell you right away, we know that our Guru Raj said, I am not a teacher for monks nor monkeys. I am a teacher for householders, and I want my chalers to lead normal lives. So right away, there's a little bit of a disconnect between early monastic Buddhism and the great Buddha, who was a renunciant monk. And early Buddhism uh, grew into a path called the Theravadan, the Theravadan, which means the forest teachers or the forest tradition, meaning you left your home, you were homeless. Uh, or it's called the Hinayana. That's a little bit of a thing that annoys the Theravadans. The Hinayana means the little raft. The raft is the, the little boat which will take you from the shores of suffering and delusion to the promised land. And it's called the little raft because it was seen as really focusing pretty much on your own personal happiness. Having said that, a Hinayana attitude, an attitude of Hinayana, that I am unhappy, what can I do with myself? That's a very appropriate attitude for a beginning spiritual aspirant, totally appropriate. And a lot of us spend our entire spiritual lives handling our stuff, trying to overcome our suffering, try to find inner peace. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, unless you get that managed first, you aren't going to go anywhere, really. But back to Buddhism. Renounce the world. Buddha said that the world is on fire with desire. He said the reason why people are happy is because they don't like what's going on right now. And you think, well, I'm pretty happy. And I can ask yourself, are you totally happy with everything in your life? Are you okay with everything? And of course you say, no, of course not. You know, we need more money or, you know, I, I don't like my relationships or I don't like politically what's going on. And Buddha would say, yes, yes, this is called dukkha, suffering. You know, so I'm going to try to, uh, he encouraged his monks to renounce the world. The world was on fire. And the solution to suffering, said the Buddha, eliminate desire. Okay. Now, did our guru teach about eliminating desire? No, he did not. And in fact, he did a very eloquent and beautiful satsangs about how do we work with this natural desire we have for things to be different. So, but back to original Buddhism, the renunciate path. What are some of the basic ideas of Buddhism? And I can't spend much time on each one of them. The ones you should know about is, uh, I'm going to bow up your notes, the famous Four Noble Truths, which are when Buddha, you guys know he was a great prince. He had had everything in the world he could ever want. He was one of the upper one half of 1% in terms of wealth of ancient India. He gave it all up to go to the forest to find the true meaning of happiness. It's a wonderful myth, largely invented, although I think there was a historic Buddha. But I'm going to give you, skip the story. I'd love to tell it to you. Go to what he came up with. He thought about it for four or five days under the famous Bodhi tree where he had attained enlightenment. Okay, he thought about it. And by the way, see the film called Little Buddha, which is a great, you know, Hollywood depiction of the life of the Buddha. But they end it right when they get to the philosophy. He said there's four basic truths about the world called the four noble truths. They are, he said, life is about desire. It's about wanting things to be something other than they are. And life is, even if you're happy, it never lasts. It always sooner or later turns into discontent. And at the end of it, you feel like you're going to die. So like, what's the point? He said, that's called dukkha or suffering. The second thing he said is, the truth of suffering is it's caused by this desire that you have. You're not content with things the way they are. You can't, your whole mind is structured about wanting things to be different. Okay? He said, then the third truth is, he said, but guess what, guys? The good news is, this is not inevitable. There is such a thing as the end of suffering. It's called Tanha is the ancient Pali kana, the ancient uh, term in India for this, this restless desire. But there's an end to it, he said. It's possible to achieve the extinction, the total elimination 
there's a wonderful way they express this the utter cessation the non-arising of desire you can completely eliminate it at its root this is called nirvana which is the extinction of any desire you have for anything to be any different than what it is in a nutshell he said how do you do that he said oh noble he said by the way the buddha called himself he said i'm just a doctor after his enlightenment people came to him and they said god oh my are you some kind of a god and he said oh no in fact they said well does god exist he says i'm not even going to talk about god forget it they said but are you just an ordinary human being he said no well then what are you he said i'm awake very famous i'm awake so okay he said i'm a doctor i'm a physician you're sick with desire i have the antidote i have the medicine it's called the noble eightfold path central to buddhism what is the noble eightfold path briefly because you could spend a lifetime worrying about this he says the secret to eliminating desire and achieving nirvana and at total peace practice right speech practice right action that's two practice a livelihood that is conducive to your spiritual benefit that's number three right effort don't be you know put your backbone into it as guru raj would like to say it is you get very little it says you get uh, nothing for nothing and very little for five cents you do something so that's right effort right mindfulness learn how to control your mind uh this is central to garage too that's why you guys do trata that's why we protect samskara shuddhi which is the purification of some some above some scars all these things i know that raman has talked to you about all right that's why we practice right effort and right uh, morality which just means being nice to people and don't do things to other people that you wouldn't have them to do onto you that's the heart of it so right mindfulness right concentration trata learn how to focus your attention do you remember our guru said many times he said the secret to life is concentration and non concentration he said if you would like success in life learn how to concentrate so right concentration the next one right understanding buddhism says all the schools of buddhism says you've got three big problems that are making you unhappy first is your mind is totally out of control you can't concentrate that thing you can't focus it you don't know how to control those wacky thoughts which keep happening to you second thing your emotions are a wreck sometimes you're happy sometimes you're sad sometimes you're angry sometimes you're full of love but your emotions are coming and going seemingly randomly and they drive you nuts third thing the big problem you guys have is we don't know what the heck is going on we are profoundly ignorant about who we are why we're in the world what's going on okay those three root clashes they're called or distressing situations as the buddhists call it those three i think guru raj would have no problem with it those are your problems your mind's out of control your emotions are out of control and you don't know what the heck is going on all right ignorance it's called so that's right understanding and the final thing is right thought this is what i like to call from guru raj days karma management he says you know he says guru raj says you know you practice for bad good bad deeds and then you practice five good deeds and then you're one in the credit you know we practice right action we th- try to think positively we get over all our repetitive thought patterns anyway those are the noble eightfold path if you're intrigued we have google which tells you everything uh let's see other foundational buddhist stuff appro- you know applicable to all the schools of buddhism the four main principal approaches in buddhism but founded uh, emphasized by the buddha was the famous no self doctrine of buddhism which is totally misunderstood so often misunderstood totally guru raj would have no problem with this 
In fact, he would give you quite a talk on it. It's called anika, or the non-existence of self. All they were saying is, the Buddha said later on, he says, listen, you guys all believe in this soul, and they believe you believe your personality incarnates from life to life to life. He says, that's not so. He said, what was going on actually for you is, there isn't a single self-contained mind. You're a collection of processes what the Buddha called the skandhas. He says, uh, you know, you've got a part of yourself that's emotional. You've got one part of yourself that has a social self, you know, who you are to the world in your workplace. You've got another person who you are with your significant other. You have another person in your private thoughts. We have different ways, you know, we process information. The mind is a system. It's not a single self-contained entity. That's what he meant by no self. He meant it's a collective self. Finally, the other one was impermanence, incredibly important to, uh, uh, to Buddhism, and I'll maybe discuss it more, but the idea that everything is constantly changing and we're unhappy because we want things to stay the way they are. We just no sooner get familiar with how things are, then they're changing all the time. In fact, that's nothing. there's nothing but change. Everything is constantly changing. And the final big concept is this notion of nirvana. Notice I didn't call it enlightenment. Enlightenment is something different. Nirvana means the extinction of personal desire, the extinction of your individual suffering. Okay? That is the goal in original Buddhism. The other big term is all those folks out there who say, I'm into mindfulness, and I'm studying vipassana, and I'm learning how to be mindful. Buddha really emphasized, he said, you need to know what's going on in your multiple selves. What's going on with you? And to do that, you've got to pay attention to what's going on. So he taught four approaches to mindfulness called the four foundations of mindfulness. This is still very actively taught. By the way, the Hinayana, what they call it, or the Theravadan schools, they, for centuries, were basically about small monastic communities in Southeast Asia. They still are. Old, original, the, the, the Theravadan schools now, believe it or not, most of them are about people who show up in monastic robes and they chant sutras all day. The emphasis on meditation and the return to some of the Buddha's original concepts about learning about mindfulness. That's a fairly recent emphasis, and they've retailored it to suit we Westerners. But I'm telling you originally, when you hear about people like, uh, I'm into Thich Nhat Hanh, and I'm really, I've been taking his mindfulness course. You notice the mindfulness people won't talk to you about divinity. There's no, there shouldn't be any green Taurus and all that stuff around there. They say, I want you to sit down and we're going to pay attention to what's going on with your mind. You say, what about the guru? Forget about the guru. The guru was a human being like you and me. He was a psychologist. He was a doctor. They don't really, they, they didn't think of the Buddha as a divine being. Okay. In fact, the discussion of the divine is not a big part of mindfulness-based teachings now but they will teach you this okay you guys it's going to take you a while but you're going to get results you're going to control your emotions and learn how to control your thoughts first step I want you to pay attention to your breathing you guys familiar with that you know follow the breath and buddha had elaborate teachings on training yourself to follow the breath it is the way to start meditating how to get people to start Square one and maybe the rest of your life. Pay attention to your breathing. The second thing the Buddha will teach you. I gave this advice just yesterday to a person. Learn how to follow the, what does your body feel like? Have you guys familiar with the term the body scan? Standard technique in mindfulness-based uh, teachings nowadays. They learn you to pay attention to the sensations of the body the rhythms of the body. Buddha taught that as another major, the four foundations of mindfulness. That's two, pay attention to the body. The third one is pay attention to what's going on in your head, your, your thoughts, your emotions, your dreams, when you, you drift off, when you're unconscious, when you're really wrapped attention, when you're anxious, learn these various kinds of mind states. And the Buddha's actually, the Buddhists make lists of these things. You know, and this is, this is what we do, and we talk about this a lot. 
in uh, in uh, uh, AMS meditation. Uh, that would include, remember, your samskaras. You guys all know that many of your emotional states are rooted in your samskaras. Also rooted in your samskaras is the fourth of these four stages of mindfulness training. It's called contemplation of dharmas. What is a dharma? A dharma, as it's now understood, the correct meaning of dharma is not religious truth. It means the way something works is its dharma. There's a dharma of going to work. There's a dharma of being with your spouse. There's a dharma of your kids. You know, how do things work? You know, it's our little program, our little internal computer program on managing different situations in our life. Uh, so it means our belief systems, our expectations, our, our stories about what things are is a dharma. Pay attention to those. Your explanations for the world that you tell yourself all the time, those are your dharmas. Pay attention to those. So those are the four foundations of, of mindfulness. And there's a lot more. But to make a big story, uh, a little, uh, I mean, a, a big story quickly, I got to go in. Buddhism very rapidly evolved to start including uh, people other than these very severe monks who would eat one meal a day and they'd meditate 10 hours a day and they, they had no money, no possessions, no sex, and, you know, they were strict renunciates. That's a little harsh. So they opened it up a little bit. And there were a lot of people that sort of missed having their gods and goddesses. So remember, this is ancient India. They began to have the Mahayana is the next big school of Buddhism. And it means the great raft. It means the road for everybody, the path for anybody to come in. The original Hinayana path was strictly monastic. Nowadays, they've been upped it to include we Americans. Very few of us are monks. The Mahayana from the get-go was we're going to have a monastic community, but they're going to teach the rest of everybody, and everybody's going to be part of it. A little like the Catholic Church. It was like the, the, the Buddhism for everybody. Um, first up, the Mahayana people early on said, yeah, this Nirvana stuff is cool, especially for the monks, but what about you guys who are householders? You know, I'm sorry, it's too late. You know, you've got kids, you're worried about paying the bills, you know. This stuff about running away from the world to extinguish desire, well, that's just not going to work for you. What you guys are going to do is the Arhats, those people, those are the, the, the masters of the Hinayana, they're achieving liberation on Nirvana in this life. Said, so you guys are after something bigger. You guys are after enlightenment. Enlightenment, sign up for it now, guys. You're going to work towards it. It's going to be many, many, many lives down the road, but it's okay. Because guess what? You've got people rooting for you. You've got the equivalent of what they call saints. You've got the bodhisattvas. Those are very evolved souls. And people talk about bodhisattvas in all ways, but basically they're beings that are totally dedicated to your benefit. Okay? We also have wisdom, enlightened beings that are not, they aren't gods. They're almost like people like you, but very evolved. And they turn into people like Green Tara. Green Tara is supposed to have started out as a princess. And the story about Green Tara, you guys all heard of Green Tara? She's very, I'm very fond of her because she's supposed to be, uh, uh, she's fearless. She teaches fearlessness. She was a princess that somebody said, you know what? You can't achieve nirvana if you're a woman. And she said, oh, yeah. I'll show you guys. And she did. She became an enlightened bodhisattva. And she is a goddess within the Mahayana pantheon. And there's lots of them. You guys all know uh, um, um, Avalokiteshvara or uh, what's his other name? Chenrezi. He's the god of love, the god of compassion. You know, you go to, you know, you know, it's like, help me, oh, Chenrezi. So there was a lot of sort of ritual worship. The hipsters within the Mahayana said, these are actually just spiritual ideals. But for most of us, they kind of almost become real people. And it's a little like when we try to get used to what Guru Shakti is about. Are we worshiping the Guru? And then, and, and, you know, you say, no, no. You're worshiping actually the aspiration. You're, you're worshiping, you're, you're dedicating yourself to a spiritual ideal. You're not worshiping people. Okay, there's similar discussion around the notion of a bodhisattva. Another big deal that they teach in the Mahayana that you've heard of, your students might bring up the notion of bodhicitta, which means enlightened awareness. It means having 
a wisdom, enlightened love, acceptance of all the suffering in the world, of all the beings of the world. And, uh, you know, they would say, you Hinayana people, you monastic people, you're only concerned about your own suffering. We, Bodhicitta people, we have a mind of total love. Like Guru Raj, you know, I love, you know, you love everybody. You have kindly feelings towards everybody. And this is the wisdom mind which you develop in Bodhicitta. You make an aspiration. You make a prayer. I vow to become a bodhisattva. It's my bodhisattva vow. What is a bodhisattva? It's a being that feels total bodhicitta, love for all sentient beings. Okay? The Mahayana came up with whatever you're listening to, and there is a lot of spiritual stuff out there. If it has these four following characteristics, it's Buddhist. Okay? First characteristics is if the teaching involves impermanence, the teaching that there is no solid anything in this world, everything is comprised of change and transformation. In fact, the Buddhists say that anything that's made out of other things, like compounded out of elements, like we are, we're made out of, you know, water and potassium and whatever like that. Sooner or later, it dissolves. That includes political systems. That includes ideas. Democracy had a beginning, it has a middle, and it will have an end. Everything changes. Okay? The only thing that doesn't change is changing. That stays perpetual. Second seal. Anything that your ego is involved with, that's me, mine, the grasping to wanting things to be the way you want them to be. Anything that's conditioned with ego is going to be ultimately be painful. You'll have pleasure when you're eating your ice cream, but then you eat up all the ice cream and then you're, you know, you get fat and then you're sad. Anything connected with grasping or neediness or ego is going to cause problems. That's seal number two of all Buddhist schools. Third one, the hardest one of all, is the famous emptiness doctrine. Uh, what does emptiness mean? It means that everything is atoms and molecules. And even if it's atoms and molecules, what the heck are atoms and molecules? You're told that it means, well, they're ultimately energy. You guys, We all know this. It's part of our culture. It's the way the physicists have understood the idea of, energy, of, of emptiness. Everything is actually just energy. Things shifting, things changing. Okay, it's energy displays. And they make themselves into temporary agglomerates called planets, called people but they dissolve sooner or later back into energy. That's probably the quickest and easiest way to understand the notion of emptiness. It does not mean that nothing's there. It means there's plenty there, but everything that's there is constantly changing, and it will ultimately there's nothing there. You guys maybe talk to your students about this. According to the physicists, we're made out of atoms and molecules. You guys know that an atom is almost all space. And something they now know, even the interior atom is also simply space. It's made out of quarks and gluons, God knows what. Ultimately, it's just energy exchange. There's nothing there. And we check ourselves out and we seem solid, but there's really nothing there. And emptiness is a cause for great celebration, ultimately. Thank God, Guru Raj. You know, Guru Raj is about joyousness, not being about miserable. Don't be scared of emptiness. Emptiness is the same thing as love. Because everything shows up anyway, even though it's empty. It's just love. Emptiness is a big topic. That's number three of the four seals of Dharma. And the fourth seal is that there is a way out of our suffering. If you're listening to a teaching somewhere, they're saying, it all sucks and then you're going to die. That's not, it's not very good spiritual teaching. It's just nihilism. It's a belief in nothing. Or people that say, it's like, if you don't sign up and become a socialist, that's the end of the world. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not what he's talking about here. Okay? There is such a thing as happiness. There's an end to suffering. So those are the four C 
seals of Buddhism. I've also talked about this uh, idea of relative, or I didn't actually, I'll introduce new uh, uh, it now. Central idea in the Mahayana is the notion of that there is this relative reality, cars, people, family, pets, cats, skies, weather, and then their absolute reality of love emptiness. Everything is simply energy display. Central to Buddhism. It's also central to your happiness and well-being. When I read my Guru Raj, he's all about this stuff. Everybody, we all have our personal Guru Raj, but his satsangs that I love to read uh, once a month. You guys are, I hope you guys will tune in and listen to me read his satsangs. They're all about this concept of love emptiness. Anyway, the great Mahayana. There is more to it, and I explained. Uh, I am going through my summary, my 36 page summary. There is more to it, but let's move on to the third kind of, you say, God Almighty, we've got the renunciate, the Buddha, you know, these monks sitting in the forest somewhere. Then they have these Mahayana people talking about love, emptiness, and every th relative and absolute reality, and the Bodhisattvas and the Bodhisattva, Bodhicitta ideal. There's another one. He said, yep. In ancient medieval India, they had these tantric practitioners, much misunderstood term tantra, just means scriptures. Tantra people, they were formed, they were practicing very elaborate ritual practices, appeasing mysterious deities, incense, doing exotic forms of kundalini meditation. They were the tantric practitioners in medieval India. And as I found out from my studies out here is, basically it was transported directly into Tibetan Buddhism and used to be a big part of medieval Indian Buddhist civilization. It's tantric Buddhism. And the fancy term is the diamond vehicle. That's the Vajrayana. Mahayana meant big raft, diamond vehicle. A Vajra is like a thunderbolt. It's like a great, powerful, it's like a light lightsaber. It's a lightsaber. That's exactly what a Vajra is. It's a lightsaber. The lightsaber vehicle, the Vajrayana. And it was considered, because it involved elaborate training, elaborate mental development, and very severe discipline. You practice these called sadhanas, these ritual sadhanas, and you do all these exotic concentration of the mind. Any of those people that come to you say, I like kundalini, you know, and I, I, I'm into, uh, what, what, what else would they say? Um, I love Kali. She's a tantric deity. I like Kali, too. She represents, as you guys all know from your yoga classes, transformation, change, and the death of the ego. Boy, is that a Vajrayana concept. We uh, worship these spiritual ideals out there. Did Guru Raj ever teach any kind of tantra? Only very indirectly. The only real aspect of Guru Raj, because, you know, he wanted to be a guru for the real stuff, but for everybody. And Vajrayana is extremely demanding and really sometimes very weird. And it just, some people love it, some people are totally put off. Guru Yoga is central to the Vajrayana, and uh, uh, it's central to AMS. Again, we don't worship a human being, we worship what would be a Guru Yoga. Actually, the way the Vajrayana people, we worship spiritual energy. We're involved with cultivating spiritual energy. So, let me see... Uh, oh, karma and reincarnation. Boy, is that a big one. I'm going to mention something that is a Mahayana and Vajrayana concept that's good for you guys to know. There are four spiritual qualities that if you're a high-level bodhisattva or if you're a very serious Vajrayana practitioner, four limitless aspects of being a totally liberated and enlightened person okay, that you guys should know about. All you guys will like that. They're called the four immeasurables. They are the spiritual virtues which we all cultivate. The first one is loving kindness. My God, Guru Raj, what an exemplar of loving kindness. Metta, you know, open, loving, accepting attitude towards everyone and everything. You look at Trump. Some of you love Trump. A lot of people hate Trump. The meta attitude towards Trump is understanding, open, accepting, loving attitude towards everyone. Think about that, what life would be like if more people practiced meta. So why don't we get busy and start doing it? Second immeasurable is compassion, karuna. 
Compassion means is their unhappiness is your unhappiness. It's personal. If you look and you see an animal suffering or a person suffering automatically without even thinking, you want to go do something for that person. It's just an instinct. It's natural. That's compassion. The exercise of compassion, it's limitless. Meaning it can start out small. If your child is sick, you feel terrible. Eventually it will become that you feel terrible about uh, every all the suffering in the universe. Guru Raj was very clear, uh, you know, that he felt keenly this, okay? And, but again, our guru is a model for these four aspects of enlightened awareness. The third is one I love called appreciative joy. You love it when you see happiness, people doing well. When you look at the cat videos and you see that somebody, the little dog jumping into the water to rescue the cat, which I watched the other day, and you just swell up in joy. You love it. You love happiness. You like people being kind to one another. It's just automatic in you. You like happy, virtuous situations. That is the third measurable, appreciative joy. The first one is equanimity. Okay? It means, in Guru Raj, total Guru Raj teachings, it means whatever is going on, do you remember our guru loved the poem by Rudyard Kipling called If? Read that poem. The poem is, if you in the midst of chaos, everything's going haywire, but you can maintain your presence of mind. You, you know, he said, you know, I'm sorry, he was a sexist. You're a man, my son, you know, and the world is yours. You know, nowadays, quite properly, he used to say, you're a woman my dear, and the world is yours. If you can maintain your composure, if you cannot be knocked off base, or if you are knocked ba off, a, off base, you're upset, very quickly you get over it. Quickly, we all know some of us, or all of us, certainly other people, they're still upset about things that happened to them in fourth grade. Time to get over it. Don't you think? And I'm not going to talk about karma. But I am going to mention what samskara is. Oh, excuse me, samsara. Big key, Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhist concept. What is samsara? It means a state of suffering. The Buddhists have elaborate ways they talk about it. My favorite teacher says, what is samsara? Your wandering, bewildered mind is samsara. The way you normally think is your samsara. The world, the delusion and unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Okay, big topic. But what I want to move on to, I've got a feeling that I've done, actually. Here's the Vajrayana. I did mention the guru. Central is a deep, powerful relationship with your guru. Is central to the Vajrayana, the diamond path. I mentioned the two truths. I'm going to mention something very interesting to you guys that our guru hinted at. It's part of the Vajrayana, excuse me, the Mahayana, but more than that, the Vajrayana tradition. Two stages of, three stages of meditation. First is concentration. I think Ramans talked about this. Control your thoughts enough that you at least aren't wandering all over the place. Second thing is calm, abiding meditation, which is often what AMS teaches with the prep mantra. Okay? And they also, some of us are practicing your shamatha meditation, calm abiding meditation. Shine, it's also called in Chinese tradition. It means simply to calm down, develop a certain control of your thoughts, learn how to disconnect, become the observer of your thoughts and your emotions so you aren't so directly involved. All right? Standard AMS how to practice meditation is practice your shamatha meditation. However, in one key satsang, which maybe Raman remembers, our guru once said, sooner or later, you begin to ask this question, who am I? Who am I? What am I really? And Guru Raj said, as I remember in that satsang, said, then the real meditation begins. That's called vipassana. Okay, vipassana meditation. Not, not to be confused with insight-based meditation, which is back in the Hinayana mindfulness tradition. Vipassana means insight meditation. What is, who am I? What really is the nature of reality? You subtly get the calm mind of shamatha, and you begin to look inward. Okay? 
it's foundational. Shamatha and Vipassana meditation, foundational to Buddhism, also foundational to AMS. And uh, Raman, I think we should emphasize the difference more. Guru Raj loved to talk about who am I? What does, you know, what is divinity? What is this? That's really when it gets, you've got the tools, that's when you begin to use them. Okay? So, the Vajrayana. I think I'm going to skip. Oh, did you know one definition of mantra, which might be different than what Raman said? In, in the Tibetan tradition, in the Vajrayana, it's called protecting the mind. Protecting it from what? From your crazy ideas. Just like we're taught in AMS. When you were like off on La La Land and you're, you're, you're dreaming again, you bring the mind gently back to your mantra. And I love that Raman is teaching you the mantra is no arbitrary symbol. It is not arbitrary. You can't just meditate on pizza. A lot of the, our poor students are taught everything can become a mantra. If you are a Vajrayana practitioner and you have perfected your mind, okay, and you have a very advanced in the Vajrayana vision, eventually what happens is all of your speech, everything you hear, the birds, the clouds, everything becomes sacred. Then everything is mantra. Everything you see, according to the Vajrayana, when you've obtained self-realization, everything you see is a Buddha realm. Everything is sacred and perfect, exactly the way it is. And every one of your thoughts, your imagination, your mental landscape is all emptiness. It's the, the lev emptiness lovingness. It's the mind of a Buddha. That's the perfected state. That's the, what, what Guru Raj, the self-realized state. Guru Raj is a perfect example of a great Vajra master. Loosely, Guru Raj once explained, you know, you can hear him talk about this tape. He said to us, when he looked at us, he saw nothing but lights. He saw enlightened beings. We see a guy sitting up there gassing off. We see our problems. He saw our divinity. That's the Vajrayana vision. That is the goal. That's what we're, that level of, that's reality. We're living in delusion, but that is reality. So, mantra, mudras are sacred hand gestures. Guru Raj didn't do that much of that, but you will see a lot of people are into Vajrayana, love the rituals, the bells and the gongs, and they have them, they call the Dorje. You can see the Vajrayana Tibetan masters doing all this stuff, and people who love the Vajrayana, frankly, just love all that stuff. It's a spiritual circus, and we didn't do much of that at AMS. We had a circus, but it wasn't quite like the Vajrayana circus with all this sacred stuff. But I want to cut to, since I only have 20 minutes, I'm going to cut through. Oh, one last, one more thing about the Vajrayana, very mysterious. It's yidams, deities that you use, that you focus on. You know that Guru Raj taught, I think, classic, the deep Indian philosophies. But he never came, he never put an emphasis on that. There was no Shiva. He would refer to Krishna a great deal, but we were not Krishna worshippers. Nevertheless, the Yidam deity and Christ and gods and goddesses are very inspiring to a lot of us. Nothing wrong with it. In the Vajrayana tradition, you focus your sadhanas, your spiritual practices towards these Yidam deities, like Green Tara. Okay? Also, in the Christian tradition, you focus your devotion towards statues of Jesus. Okay? They're called rupas in the Hindu tradition, or statues of divinities. Okay? And I'm going to skip some of the other really exaggerated stuff. Oh, the other cool thing you do in the Vajrayana, which I was doing for a while, you visualize yourself as one of these deities. And I like to visualize... I'm, Hope you guys will forgive me. I have to see your face, but I like to visualize myself as Parvati or, or uh, as Green Tara. So it's kind of fun. I would sit there and I would have breasts and a vagina and I would be uh, flowing hair and I would be beautiful and I would be 16 and I was practicing fearless compassion and I was green and I was Green Tara. You visualize yourself as the deity. It's a lot of fun. You know, in the Christian tradition, which I know Ramon refers to, you'd have people that would identify with Christ so completely that they would develop the stigmata. 
And people are like, Mike, that's because they completely identified with who Jesus was and what Jesus did, and they actually turned it to him. You can do it if you want. Guruaj never quite talked about it this way, but I would suggest we focus on focusing on, look at that wonderful, that crazy guy, Guruaj. He's totally free. He's totally joyous. He'll do anything. He's not scared of nothing. That's not bad. Let's try to emulate him. Not a bad practice. Focus on the guru as a spiritual ideal. You say, well, you know, he did things I didn't quite approve of. Well, you know, you do things that you, you yourself don't approve of. Why don't you just forgive yourself? Get over it. Anyway, focusing on the gurus. Finally, I'm going to cut to the last one, my personal favorite. It's actually considered a subset of the Vajrayana, and it's very mysterious. It's called Zogchen, the Great Completion. And I'm thinking of, I got an uh, email the other day from one of the Buddhists, and she's a fairly new practitioner. She quickly went from mindfulness-based meditation, which is the Hinayana. Then she fell in love with a little Chenrezig Buddhist center in Philadelphia, which I still belong to. She went to a green Tara thing, immediately got it. Moved into loving kindness, meta, you know, uh, uh, loving, you know, uh, uh, universal love, the four, equi you know, equanimity, loving kindness, compassion, and uh, 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 I think I covered all four there. And then she heard about Dzogchen. Oh, my God. She said she didn't quite get it, but she understood it. Dzogchen is called the Great Completion. It's considered the most advanced form of meditation in the Buddhist tradition. All four principal schools, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, the Vajrayana, and the Dzogchen schools, practice what they call the direct path. In a nutshell, here what it, here's what it is, and I'm coming to the end here. They say all the rest of you guys are pretending... Ramon and I were talking about this on the phone the other day. All the rest of you guys are all worried about enlightenment or happiness or nirvana. It's a goal that you're working towards. You're acquiring what the Buddhists would call merit, which means uh, acquiring um, um, good patternings, working with your samskaras, and insight, deeper and deeper understanding into the nature of reality. You're working on accumulating. It's the path of accumulation. And one of these days, maybe another lifetime, you'll be, quote, enlightened. Well, the Dzogchen people lean over to you like this, and they say, you know, you're already God. Guru Rai says this all the time. You're divine right now. There's no place to go to. Whatever you have right now is there because you are manifesting it. Who are you? You're not your body. That changes all the time. You're not your personality. That changes all the time, too. You're not what you believe. You're not even what you're scared of. You're the source. You're the space. You're the arena. You're the consciousness. Satchitananda. You are the awareness out, within which all of this comes and goes like clouds, like weather. You are that great vessel of experience where all this is happening now by seemingly by magic out of the power of divinity. You are divine exactly the way you are. You're divine now. You simply don't know it. And then you think you know it, but if you think you know it, anything, it means that you also, some part of you suspect, well, I think it now but what about the time when somebody scratches your car? Are you divine then? Or are you just pissed off? The Dzogchen people lean over and say, you're always divinity. Just sometimes you're divinity that forgets what it is. And then other times you're divinity that remembers what it is. A story that I love that kind of illustrates Dzogchen is a great god, Siva, which by the way is you. You are Shiva. She was up in heaven and feeling, I'm feeling pretty blissed out. I wonder how those other folks down there on earth are doing. And uh, they said, well, why don't you check it out, see? But he said, I think I'll do that. So he turned himself into a pig. And first he said, this is intense. God is wonderful being a pig, because I was up in Siva, and I couldn't really feel anything. I was just all blissed out. But I'm a pig. I get to, it's fun to eat the mud, and then I, I've got the girl pig over here, and we have piglets together, and I get to eat mush every day. It's cool. And after a while, he forgot entirely that he was God. And the gods up there were up in heaven, and they were looking down and said, wait a minute, where, where's Siva? And he sees he's down me and a pig. 
what the hell is he doing down there for? We need him up here. It's like, well, you better go tell him about that because he's forgotten entirely the Yeshiva. So, you know, the God said, send somebody down to talk to that guy. So they went down and he said, hey, hey. And the pig went, oink, oink. He said, you're Lord Siva. Don't you know that? What? You're Lord Siva. You're the God of the universe. What? Oh, my God. I forgot. <laughs> Turn back into Siva. What's the point of that story? That's each one of us. We're pretending to be pigs. We're actually God. Who would have known? That's Dzogchen. That's Dzogchen. Before I forget to, in Buddhism, as in most spiritual faiths, there is the path of the monastics, the Hinayana people, and the Mahayana people. They renounce the world to achieve God. Then there are the yogins. The yoga tradition in India, and Guru Raj was a yogi, not a monk. He was a yogin. The yogis say, I am God. I am Shiva. I am the absolute. I'm simply in a state of not realizing it completely. I'm dedicating my life to realizing my true identity as Shiva or as Guru enlightenment, divinity. You know, that briefly, Dzogchen, more to it than that, that's my favorite thing. Yeah. There is another version of it that you might come across called the Mahamudra, the Great Seal. All the Mahamudra is, is a slightly more procedural attitude towards recognizing your own divinity, is the Mahamudra. But Dzogchen and Mahamudra, the two terms you should use, they represent the direct path teachings. Okay, or they're called the fruitional vehicles. They are considered you start with what you already know, what you are. You just don't quite understand it. Then there are the uh, the gradual, the progressive paths. Okay, the paths of accumulation. They're the ones where you're working towards a goal. Some of us are in AMS. We are working towards being better people, overcoming all of our, you know, our 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 unhappinesses and overcoming our patternings, okay? And then there's some of us, or maybe you wake up after a while and figure like, Guru I said we're divine. And yeah, a lot of times in my meditation, I really, I get that. We are divine already, we simply don't know it. Okay? So, the four paths I've told you about today, remember them, the Hinayana, all those people are mindfulness-based people that come to you, and they're not interested in God, they're not even interested in enlightenment, they just want to be happier people, control their mind, that's the Hinayana. Then you've got all those people that are into love, and open my heart, and I want to learn how to be kind, and I love everybody, and I love Green Tara, they're your Mahayana people. Then you've got the people who are into the Kundalini, and inner meditational practices, and, and using a Kali, and, and all this kind Kind of stuff energy people they are the vajrayana people then you have the people that says hi i'm here because i love being with all my uh fellow meditators i love people who love this because i myself i don't need anything i'm completely done those people are either colossally ignorant or you might have just met uh, a pretty advanced body, uh, bodhisattva, and you might, and I, you, you will run into them. They will wander into your class. People who are far more spiritually advanced than you are, they might not even know it, but they very quickly get it. They say, "You say Guru Raj says we're all divine." He says, "Yes, I, I know that. I know that." And you say, "Are you sure?" He said, "Oh yeah, actually, they're pretty advanced Ojin people." So, Raman, how many minutes has that been? I can't hear. Do we have time for a question? I can't hear. Whoop. Okay, try again. Got it. Questions? Oh, all right. Sorry. Sorry. Good. Oh, and I'm sorry I kept you away from your lunch. And I'll... Monasteries, the abbot and the cook, they are the two yes. top ones. 
Cooking is very important. So Can now we go to the cooking part of the story and the sharing the food part of the story. Both of those things are bodhisattva activities, and you guys are all bodhisattvas, or you would not be at this course wanting to be teachers. That's the highest spiritual, it's a form of love, the deepest kind of love you can offer to others. It's liberation, it's spiritual truth. Okay, thank you for not turning me off. All right. Bye-bye, guys. So time time to cook now, so namaste with the skinny Wow. Wow. So who cuts the